when people said things like that I don't love this country or that I'm like un-Australian or something, I feel like that's so far from the truth, mostly because I'm a proud Gamilaroi woman, but I'm also a proud Bogan. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter, candid conversations that count. There's a fresh new face on Breakfast TV, and her name is Brooke Boney. Brooke describes herself as a proud Gamilaroi woman, and Brooke has every reason to be proud. She grew up in a housing commission. She was raised by a strong single mother. She's the eldest of six kids. And when she was little, all Brooke could imagine for her future was a life that involved finishing school, hopefully, marrying a coal miner maybe, and probably becoming a mum. So how did this girl from the Hunter Valley in New South Wales end up as the Today Show's entertainment reporter, smack bang in the middle of some very high drama at the program and unimaginable public scrutiny. Here's Brooke Boney to tell her story. Brooke, tell me where you grew up. I grew up in a really beautiful little town called Mosselbrook. So I think when I was there, there would have been about 10,000 people. And it's in the Hunter Valley of New South Wales, which is maybe about three hours northwest of Sydney. It's such a beautiful place. I was born there. And then I lived there right up until I was 17. You didn't have your dad in your life when you grew up? No, I didn't. Like sort of for little bits and pieces, but no, it was it was mostly my mum. So I used to go and visit him sometimes during school holidays. But my mum did it all on her own. She's very proud, you know, like she's not the sort of person who wanted help from him, if that makes sense. Like she was like, no, I'm, you know, I'm doing it on my own. You know, that's that was her... How did she actually do that? Because there were six of you. You were the yeah, eldest. I'm the oldest. And are you quite close together? Like what's the age range? Yeah. So my youngest sister is 19 now, I think. Yeah, I and think you're 31? Turned, I'm 31. I'm turning 32 next week though. Oh. So happy birthday to me. Happy birthday feels to you. feels weird to be saying I'm 32. It feels like I'm a grown up now. Like yeah. I should actually be a lot more mature than what I am. I really lean into um, immaturity and giggling and laughing a lot. Did you feel ambiguous about turning 30? Was that a big birthday for you? It was. I mean, I, I tend to not really care that much about birthdays. I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, it's a birthday month. I mean, I do like getting presents, though. I'm not going to lie about that. I, I definitely please send me presents if you're listening to this right now. But no, I, I don't know. Was it difficult to turn 30? Did I feel weird? Maybe a little bit because, you know, when you're little and you imagine what your life is going to be like when you're 30 and you're like, is this what I'd imagined? And... I think I'd done a lot of the things that I, I felt like I, I wanted to do at, the, at that age. You know, I had really strong friendships, really close relationship with my family. I, you know, hit a couple of good um, professional milestones. Yeah. Mm. I think birthdays are very much about, and Christmas as well, I think, or any sort of special occasion, but particularly birthdays, it's very related to how you feel you are in whatever internal checklist you have yeah. in your head. Yeah. Where did you think you'd be at sort of in your early 30s? When you were a little kid growing up? I thought that I would be probably like married and have children and like live in a house or something like that, I think. In um, the town you grew up in? Yeah, probably in the town that I grew up in. I remember thinking that um, like something to aspire to would be to like marry someone who was a coal miner, probably get like some sort of apprenticeship. Like I remember seeing women who were a few years older than me or, you know, maybe 10 years older than me and thinking that they, they were really cool and that that would be something that I would want to do or, you know, hope that I would want to do. But I also was – I really knew that I wanted to get out of um, out of Musselbrook and not because it's not a great town because it is. I really love country areas but just because I wanted to see the world and I wanted to see what else was out there and I felt very stifled by, by the town and one of my best friends at school was this girl called Ashley Lonigan and I'm still great friends with her now and her mum, Karen, was this like incredibly vivacious like – uh, worldly woman and she was American and she'd done all of this travel and seen all of this excellent music and she knew about art and food and you know I, I was like oh, I want to see the things that she's spoken to us about you know like being able to see what she'd experienced I wanted a taste of that. You've said before you can't be what you can't see what could you see when you were a little girl in Musselbrook and you looked at your options? Um, I think probably a little bit of everything. I think, like, I, I don't want to, like, romanticise what it's like to grow up in, in Housing Commission or anything like that because it's it's really hard and you think about things like money or jobs or prosperity as, as things that will never happen to you or that you'll never get to experience. And um, 
you know, you're living paycheck to paycheck and, you know, sometimes you don't even make it paycheck to paycheck. You're sort of borrowing from family members or getting people to bring around food or, you know, we used to get like salvos, hampers and things like that sometimes as well. And it's a really difficult experience when you're a kid because I think it forces you to grow up a bit faster than the people around you. And I, I, I was reading something the other day where it said that, you know, even children's IQ can be affected by poverty or by growing up poor because you're, you're always sort of stressed, you know, even though you're not dealing with paying bills yourself or whatever, you're always sort of surrounded by things that are a little bit more tough than, you know, say if you're, if you're a middle-class family. And, yeah, I think I was very aware of that when we were growing up. You know, like we didn't have a car, mum didn't have a licence and, you know, we didn't, have, um, we didn't have a lot. And I remember um, <laughs> seeing this, um, this one family in town, the girl had like a, a new outfit and I think it was like our netball fundraiser or something like that at the movies. And I remember thinking, if she gets a new outfit this close to Christmas, then what does she get for Christmas? You know, like, what do you have to look forward to if you're getting presents in November? Just for no reason. For no reason. Like, oh, gosh, it must be nice to be that rich. Or seeing people with, like, um, Converse slides, like the girls a couple of years older than me with Converse slides and thinking, like, that is so cool. I wonder what it's like to be able to afford whatever it is you want at whatever time. Um, yeah, so, you know, you're definitely aware of it. It's not like you walk around feeling sorry for yourself. And I definitely wasn't like that. You know, I always thought I'm going to make sure that I'm never, ever that poor, but I didn't know if I would ever be lucky enough to sort of get out of it. And be able to buy Converse slides yeah. for yourself. Well, they don't make them. I think that they should because there's like a 90s revival yeah. happening. You need to wear them with socks. Absolutely. <laughs> if they're bringing back Adidas trackies, they should bring back Converse slides. As the eldest, I imagine you were more in tune with your mum than your younger siblings in terms of the stresses of trying to make ends meet and paying mm. bills. Yeah. What impact did that have on you and how much sort of responsibility did you have with having to take care of your younger siblings? I think that when you're the oldest, you do sort of take on a little bit more of that burden. And mum tagged me in something on Facebook the other day and uh, it was like um, the eldest is always cranky and bossy because they ended up having to raise children that um, they didn't have. (laughs) And I think that that's definitely true. You know, I sort of have throughout my life taken on different roles with my siblings so for the most part now I'm just their big sister and that you know I feel very comfortable being that but you know when some of them were teenagers and giving mum grief or you know what girls are like when they're teenagers oh, they're yeah. awful I like we are the worst yeah <laughs> I was the worst I Mine's was really actually, bad too my teenagers okay at the moment but I was the worst yeah oh and so you know at those times having fights with my little sisters trying to get them to stay in school or you know um, not be a jerk to mum or you know get home at a reasonable hour or you know not hang out with a certain guy or whatever is yeah (laughs) it's pretty tough. You left school in year 12 Mm. just before school finished you had a lot going on and you just couldn't complete school at that time. Yeah. Did it feel like your options closed off because you hadn't got your HSC or did you always know that there'd be other ways? No, I didn't always think that there would be other ways. And, you know, I was going through a really rough trot at that time. And for ages, I just thought, okay, well, you know, this is it then. And But I I never, to be honest, I never really thought like, oh, this is the direct path that you take to university because I'd never seen anyone do it. I didn't know what, I don't even know what it looked like to do like university assignments or school assignments or um, to sort of to move to the city and, and apply for scholarships or, you know, apply for colleges or, or any – I had no idea about you any of that. You can't be what you can't see. So exactly. you haven't had any role model You didn't model have any reference that. points. It's like, you know, if someone right. walked up to us and said, oh, do you want to be an astronaut? I mean, surely we'd probably be able to figure it out between us. We're smart women. Yeah. But, you know, like if you've never seen it happen, then you, then you, can't, yeah. you can't be it. And so it wasn't until I was in my early 20s, I think I was 21, and I had a really, really lovely boyfriend and he had studied journalism at UTS – and um, I was like, oh, maybe I can do that. And then, you know, he helped me through the process and we figured it out. And then I went through and, and did it. So it was great. What did you know about journalism or what did you sort of imagine that you could be as a journalist? I actually wanted to do print, I think, when I was studying. He was working in comms and, you know, we just used to like watch a lot of news and like listen to a lot of radio and do a lot of reading. And I'd actually done 
You know when you do work experience when you're in your 10 at school? And I did it at the local radio station. So I was always really interested in broadcast. Like I loved media and TV, entertainment, music, all of that stuff. I loved it so much. So I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I didn't really think that much about TV or radio. But, you know, when you go to uni these days, you have to learn everything. Do you remember, I don't know what it was like when you went to uni, but you'd have to sort of think about what sort of journalist you want to be. So you're like, oh, well, if you're more interested in print, then take this features um, elective or, you know, take this TV elective if, if, you're, if you want to be that sort of journal. And now you just learn everything. I did the same course as you at UTS. It's good, but isn't I, it? Well, I dropped out after the first year. I wasn't as dedicated as you. <laughs> well, yeah. um, do you know who else did it? Hugh Jackman. Oh, yeah. He's around my age. I don't remember him being, I might have stayed had I noticed him. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what a great reason to stick around. How did you get your job at Triple J? So I was working at Corey Radio and one of the guys, I think it was Ollie Wards from Triple J, was sort of sniffing around all of the community radio stations trying to find like new talent or whatever. So I did a couple of demos for them to do some like mid-dawn shifts and stuff. And then I was like, oh, I kind of want to focus more on news than than sort of hosting or, or being a, a radio announcer. So I think they're very different paths, aren't they? It's hugely different. And it's funny because I've sort of swung back around and ended up at the other side of it. But he was like, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll just get you to stay involved in the station. And so I think I did a take five. So I was just sort of like in and around this. I think I did um, hack a few times like their shake up on a Friday afternoon And then I came back to the ABC after spending a few years with SBS and NITV and Matt and Alex were finishing up and their newsreader was finishing up as well. And they were bringing in a couple of guys from Adelaide who were, you know, a lot younger and they were like, well, do you want to come and, you know, be the newsreader on the show and, you know, we'll sort of make this role a bit different from what it's been in the past. You'll be like, you know, included a lot more and, you know, you'll be, um, you know, part of the team. It'll be the three of you. And I was like, oh, my gosh, absolutely, yes. Like I grew up listening to Triple J. I love that station. I feel like so incredibly lucky to have been a part of that, you know, because they're really – they're culture makers, you know, for when you're – Mm. when you're like between the ages of 15 and 25 and you're listening to the radio in the country or you know in the city as well you feel like they really get you yeah and your identity is sort of defined by listening to triple j you know like oh did you hear what adam and will did or did you hear what merrick and rosso did and kids talk about it at school it's sort of like you think that you're cool and unique because you listen to triple j but you don't realize <laughs> that there are actually like two million other kids also listening cool. to triple j and they're all cool and unique yeah exactly <laughs> and misunderstood by everyone around them. You mentioned when you worked for SBS and NITV, that's the Indigenous TV network that Mm -hmm. is on free to air. You were in Parliament House, weren't you? Mm -hmm. You were in the gallery. I was in the gallery. That's a long way from Musclebrook. Tell me about your first day. My first week was the week when Rudd knifed Gillard. And so the return of Kevin Rudd. The return of Ruddy. And I remember there being just like a lot of chatter and like people running around the, the halls. And then I think it happened on the Wednesday night. And, you know, being there to sort of witness that firsthand after watching, you know, political news and, and being sort of obsessed with Canberra um, for at least a few years, I felt you know, I, I felt like I was a part of it. It felt amazing. It was it was very, very cool. But also very quickly I realised how brutal a game politics is. How did you know how to be a political reporter? I don't think I did. Because <laughs> <laughs> that would be really intimidating going, you know, with all of those heavy hitters. Mm, it is. I think it's, it's more scary than um, interviewing any celebrity, I would say, is walking into a press conference in the Prime Minister's courtyard and having – you know, Michelle Grattan and Chris Yulman and Laurie Oakes and all of those guys there. But I would say that it's a very supportive place. You know, I remember Phil Corey always giving me sort of like pointers and, and feedback and Karen Middleton was the bureau chief when I was down there at SBS and NITV and she was always very supportive as well. But you're constantly just shitting yourself because you're like, am I going to say something stupid in front of all of these people that I admire? 
you know, whereas if you're just doing an interview with, say, Hugh Jackman, for instance. How wrong can it go? Oh, well, you're just sitting there having a yarn, yeah. you know, like it's just two people and he's not going to be like, well, you've got that fact wrong, yes, you exactly. little <laughs> idiot, get out. Not that anyone in the press gallery would do that, but it's, you know, live television, it's you're asking questions about difficult figures or policies or, you know, there's a lot that can be And there's so much context. Like I always notice when I watch Lee Sales do an interview or Annabelle Crabb, and it, they have so much information just to draw from in mm. the moment. I imagine that takes a long time to accumulate all the, the history of this one and that one and this policy and that ministry. And Yeah, it does. I don't think that there's anything that can prepare you for that. I think it's just experience. I ended up going out on the road for that election campaign with Kevin Rudd for a little bit. And the depth of knowledge that everyone has around you is, it's incredible. And, you know, that's that's why they're there because, you know, they're the best and then, you know, going out a few years later in 2016 and just feeling a million times more confident and, you know, just f- f- because you're like, oh, well, this relationship means this and, you know, he's campaigning in this seat so that must mean that they're scared about this or, you know, you just have – it, it feels like second nature. So you came back to Sydney to take the Triple J job mm. in the breakfast shift. Tell me a little bit about your life when the Today Show call came. What was your life like? Well, I was planning on doing a whole bunch of really great content with ABC. You know, we'd, we'd shot some of it even. I saw a couple of weeks ago a piece for Gardening Australia <laughs> went to air that we'd shot. And there were a lot of things that I was really, really excited about working on. But, you know, things changed pretty quickly, I think, at the Today Show. You know, it wasn't like months and months of of planning or, you know, that there's this huge sort of conspiracy or anything. So there was a new EP installed and, you know, I don't know how long after, but I got a call saying, hey, you know, would you be interested in in coming to work with us? And I'd already had some conversations with Nine about going over um, to work with them, but we hadn't quite found the right thing yet. And So you were on their radar? Yeah, I think the thing that I like talking about or that is my pitch, if you will, is that I've worked across a bunch of different mediums, right? Like I've done radio, I've done TV, I've done a little bit of online stuff. And also being able to understand an audience is a really important part of that. And having worked across different audiences is is a really valuable thing. And I think that that's probably something that they, um, I don't know, that they recognised. What was the courting process like and the decision-making process from your point of view? For me, well, I just knew that I was going to be stepping onto a show that's very high profile and that there's a lot of scrutiny on those shows. And, you know, I just sort of prepared myself and, you know, spoke to some some friends and and some family and and my boyfriend and, and thought, you know, is this is this the you know the sort of path that I want to go down and and um, you know do I do I want to work on this show and the answer was yes because um, you know when you have goals like contributing to the discourse around how Aboriginal people are viewed and see themselves to be on a show like that is is it's a huge opportunity and you know to work on on something as fun as entertainment is amazing you know like I admire Dickie so much he's been there for nearly 30 years and done an excellent job and so to be able to learn from from him and um, to sort of sink my teeth into a new round basically just sounded like a lot of fun. It's interesting what you say about the opportunity to speak to a a very different audience in terms of commercial television versus the ABC. Yeah. So I was imagining, correct me if I'm wrong, that at the ABC in many ways you have a very supportive, like-minded audience where Indigenous issues and issues around diversity and equality are not just top of mind but a high priority. So in a way it's like not preaching to the choir but I guess like-minded. A commercial audience is very different. It's much broader, you know. Mm. So in a way, was it more daunting but also you had the opportunity to change hearts and minds, which probably were already Mm. with you at the ABC. Mm. How did that factor in that that decision? Because it was obviously going to be more challenging where you were going to go. I think um, it always feels challenging um, when you're talking about Indigenous affairs because um, even even at the ABC, you know, I would say that there are a lot of people who, while sympathetic to Indigenous issues, a lot of the people I meet have never met or hung around with or worked with Aboriginal people. So... While the audience at Channel 9 might be more broad, 
for a lot of people, when I hang out with them or speak to them, it's probably the first time that they've hung around with an Aboriginal person or that they, you know, that they know of, you know, it's not like we were, you know, some sort of identifier <laughs> or something like, hey, I'm your friendly neighbourhood Aboriginal girl. Like, no, you wouldn't know. But, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of people, it's the first time that they've met someone who's Aboriginal. And so, you know, the message for me is the same. You know, I, I genuinely believe the things that I say. And I think that that's why it makes it easy to say them. You know, it's, it's difficult to sometimes hear the pushback. Um, but I would say that the thing that I have in common with the people who do push back or who do say um, nasty things is that, you know, their love for this country is as deep as mine. And we just have sort of different ways of expressing it. You mentioned the Australia Day conversation that you had on air. I want to play in full what you said uh, in the lead up to Australia Day because I think it's really important to do that so that the people have the full context mm -hmm. of what you said and how you said it. Let's take a listen to that. We're a, a country with a diversity of cultures and I think, Brooke, you can bring some, some elements of this debate too because you yourself have some personal experience from this. Totally. I'm a part of that community. So I'm a Gamilaroi woman. My family's from northern New South Wales, been there for about 60,000 years or so. Um, but the date, this date, I know it comes up every year and I'm not trying to tell anyone else what they should be doing or how they should be celebrating, but I feel like I have almost more reason than anyone else to love this country as much as I do because I'm the oldest of six kids, single mum, and I get to sit here on the Today Show and talk to you guys about this. I get to travel around the world with the Prime Minister and ask him questions about our issues. This is the best country in the world, no doubt. But I can't separate the 26th of January from the fact that my brothers are more likely to go to jail than they are to go to school. Or that my little sisters and my mum are more likely to be beaten and raped than anyone else's sisters or mum. And that started from that day. Um, so for me it's a difficult day and I don't want to celebrate it. But any other day of the year I'll tie an Australian flag around my neck and I'll run through the streets with, it, with anyone so, else. But, but why should any other day be different than the January 26th? Because that's the first day, that's the day that it changed for us, you know. Mm. That's the sort of the beginning of um, what some people would say is the end. That's the, the turning point. So do you want Australia Day to not be a celebration or do you want the day changed? Well, I, I don't want to tell anyone what they no, should be doing. No, but this is doing. just your view. I mean, my everyone's view, got their view and, and everyone's view is, welcome to it. My view is, you know, like, it. move it to the first, you know, to the, the Day of Federation, chuck on another um, public holiday at the end or just celebrate it on another day. But I, I think a day that um, suits more people is probably going to be more uniting. But isn't it also a situation, and this is this is where I get not angry about it, but upset about it in a lot of ways, is that why should it be an us versus them? You know, one of the elders there in Christina Hearn's piece spoke about let's all celebrate this country. Mm. But it seems that we can't do that. We can never get our head around that. There's always got to be this great divide. But isn't no, that, isn't, it, yeah. Can I just jump in there? Isn't that because of precisely what we've just seen? We have seen people living in a community in a way that we don't see white Australians well, living and I, I, it is just I'll, appalling yeah. to see a community in a civilised country like Australia without electricity, without running water. I mean this is just you know third world conditions, it's I, horrific. I, I don't doubt that whatsoever and we see it first hand there but I, I'm sorry but we do see white Australians in similar situations. We do see you know kids going to school without lunch, we see kids going to school without yeah, a school but TJ, uniform. You know what, like the statistics tell us that our lives are harder and that's not me making it up or saying woe is me or feel sorry for me because I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me but what I'm talking to are the statistics and that's what I said to you mm. about my brothers being more likely to go to jail mm. our lives being harder and for it for it not to be an us and them thing I think that's why we're talking about it yeah, changing. but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be an us yeah. versus them you know and well, I wish it wasn't yeah well I think the fact that we're actually having a grown-up conversation about it is yeah. the real starting point and we should be able to do that without people feeling that they can't voice their views because we welcome them all. So keep yeah. those views coming yeah, to absolutely. us here on the show. And thank, well. you for the, thank you for the insight, Brooke. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I'm more than happy to talk about this stuff. I yeah. love it. First of all, tell me about the lead up to that. Was it planned? You obviously knew it was coming. How did you feel on that day? Well, Berlo, my boss, called me. Oh, no, I, I saw him the day before and he's like, hey, so we're running a story um, that packed with Pat Cash tomorrow that Christina Hearn did um, talking about Australia Day. And, you know, I think, you know, you should say something if you want to. You know, you're a young Aboriginal woman, you're on the show, you know, you may as well say what you think. And I said, oh, okay, well, I think this is what I'll say. And, you know, kind of said a few of my thoughts. 
And he was like, yep, sounds good. Excellent. We'll see you tomorrow morning. You know, <laughs> we'll do it then. I, I knew that it would, it would um, uh, some sort of a reaction, but I just didn't know how big it would be. And, you know, I think that that's probably the most difficult thing about having expressed something so public um, that was so personal because sometimes people don't watch a whole clip. You know, they'll read a headline or they'll read some comments and then make a judgment about that. And so when people said things like, you know, that I don't love this country or that I'm like un-Australian or something, I feel like that's so far from the truth, mostly because I'm a proud Gamilaro woman, but I'm also a proud Bogan, you know, like it's not that those two things aren't mutually exclusive. And I think that the way that we've viewed Aboriginal people in the past has sort of been that, you know, you can't be, you can be one or the other if you're if you're an Aboriginal woman who's in media, then you're a massive lefty. Or, you know, if you're a, uh, campaigning for Indigenous rights, then you're a massive lefty. But I, I think that those things aren't necessarily, they're not mutually exclusive things, you know. And there are a lot of people who said things in the wash up to the stuff that I said about Australia Day, you know, who, if they sort of sat down and talked to me, would be like, oh, actually, we're on the same page here. We're actually talking about the same thing. Like, you love this country but you just think that we need to have a discussion about this. And basically that's that's all I was trying to do, I think, is, is just sort of say that there needs to be a moment as a nation where we think about the sort of country that we mm. want to be going forward and, um, you know, to be able to move forward as one, you know, people always say that, um, then we need to understand the trauma that um, some of the policies that have been pushed on Aboriginal people have caused because if you don't acknowledge the trauma of those things and you don't acknowledge how they affect us, then there's no explanation for the difference in outcomes other than race. And that's just saying that one race is better than another. And I'm, I, I'm not, that doesn't sit well with me. And, you know, like I've said before, this is the best country in the world, but we can be better. We can be better by not owning the things that have happened in the past, but acknowledging the hurt that they've caused and that it's more difficult for some people than it is for others. And that's not because I'm Aboriginal and, and someone else isn't or, you know, that um, someone else grew up poor and, and someone didn't. It's, it's that the things that have been done to us continue to affect us. And that's why, you know, there aren't any other um, Aboriginal people on commercial breakfast television because... It's a bloody hard slog, you know. It's it's not easy to overcome the things that come with being Indigenous. Is there a lot of pressure to stay calm in those situations, even when you're feeling quite emotional about something? Because you did a very, very good job, and I've been in those live TV situations before. It can be really hard to stay calm in that moment. What was kind of going through your head? Well... I really like TJ, uh, just firstly. So, you know, I didn't want to – it was never going to be something where we have a big bust up or something. And I just try not to conduct myself in that way where, where you get too emotional about things um, when you're having a, a discussion, particularly when it comes to, like, facts or statistics or something as, as big as, like, you know, our national day. And I think that there are – so many times when people have been um, in a situation where they're talking about something that's really sensitive and they let the heat of the moment sort of get to them and then you don't end up hearing either side of the discussion and you know at the end of the day I'm there to speak to all of the people who are at home I'm 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 not there to sort of satisfy my own need to um, for you know to be super emotional about something and that's the the most important thing um and I feel like when you are measured and calm and, and sort of know what you're sort of going in with, then it's easy to to maintain composure. I think that um, when you get into trouble or where you get into trouble is if you maybe can't think of exactly what point it is you're trying to execute or maybe can't think of, you know, exactly the audience that you're speaking to or something like that. I I think that... And you did. Yeah, well, I hope so. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I um I I I think as well like that's stuff that I've said a million times before. So it's not new to me and it's you know it's what I believe and it's it's what I think. So I don't need to um get emotional ab- about it. You know, it's not I think when it comes to Australia Day it gets conflated with a whole bunch of other stuff 
and people have a lot of trauma and it's their right to get upset if they want to or, or you know, when discussions get heated, absolutely, you know, do whatever it is that you want to do. But f- for me, you know, I, I was there to talk about like one particular thing. I'm not going to let sort of all of the trauma that comes with the things that I was talking about affect the way that I present myself or like, I don't, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it, you made so many really important points and you you strung together uh, a a really complex argument in a really, really concise way. You know, you referred to the fact that your brothers were more likely to go to jail, your sister and your mother were more likely to be sexually assaulted. What was the aftermath of that like? So you got off air. Did you have adrenaline pumping? Were you just, did you know what was going to happen next? I did have adrenaline pumping, but that's probably because, you know, at that time of the morning I've had like three coffees and I'm just like (laughs) amped up from being on air. Um, I did have adrenaline pumping because I felt so proud of myself and my mum messaged me after and she said, I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. And so I I felt really good. Um, I I knew that there would be some people who would disagree with what I said or who would take certain parts of it out of context and and say mean things about me. But um, I didn't quite expect it to keep sort of rolling on. I think it was maybe four or five days of of pretty intense um, coverage. But that's the thing about this country is that we all love it so much that we feel so strongly about it that we just want to keep talking about it for days and days and days. How did you look after yourself in that time? My best friend lives in Melbourne. And so Janine came over. I think we got KFC and laid in bed and watched like streamed TV shows, which is a bit of Stan, a bit of Netflix or something. But I, I, I was just trying to like sleep as much as I could, not drink, um, eat well and go for walks. But, you know, as well as saying something really huge, um, you know, I'd just been on national TV for the first time for a whole week. And so that combined with people sort of recognising your face in the street was a very weird experience. What's so it like to weird. become so famous so fast, like literally in the space of a few days? It's weird. And I, I, it's, you know, on Triple J, the audience is, is about the same. Like we get like two million people a week. Well, yeah, when I was on Triple J. And so people know the show or like listen to the, the your voice or whatever but when people recognize your face it's a whole other and the intimacy of being in, there's something about breakfast the intimacy mm. of being in people's lounge rooms and there was a lot of noise around your appointment and yeah the gossip and dicky and carl and there was a lot of heat and noise around the today show at that time too it was weird and you know i think um you, you sort of notice that people sort of treat you slightly different as well like some people um i, I remember getting a few dirty looks over the weekend after maybe I was just being paranoid I don't know but you notice when people recognize you as well because you might be like walking along and then they'll look at you and then do a double take and then like smile or like someone will be just so nice to you and you're like I know you're not being this nice to everyone like I know what you're doing here um but I'm pretty aware of that because I'm not I sort of don't believe in the hype of those things like I'm a country kid so I can you know I know bullshit when I see it. It's just a perspective adjustment though, isn't it? And sometimes it can be weirder for the people around you. How did your boyfriend cope with it? Well, he's very private. He's like intensely private. He doesn't use Instagram. You know, he's got a Facebook, but he never uses it. Um, He, I think, well, he's just really supportive. He's just very lovely. He's very private. He doesn't care. He doesn't, you know, want to be like involved in in that whole world. He's he's not busting out to go to the Logies. No, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Not planning his outfit. (laughs) No, 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 no. (laughs) Um, So he's very low key and, you know, we do long distance. So, um, you know, he's come back for the the big things. I came back over Christmas and he was, he came back to. um, Where does he live? He's um, in the UK. He's in Oxford. That's very long distance. Yeah, it's very long distance. But, you know, it's good. We're both working hard. So I think that that's part of being in a, uh, in a you know, if in a relationship. Sometimes you work really hard and you don't have much time to see each other. And then other times it's probably more intense. You know, we'll, we'll wish that we were doing long distance. Who knows? <laughs> so it, from what I understand, I, I know that it can be hard as someone who is part of a minority group who is perhaps misunderstood mm-hmm. to always be asked Whenever anything happens, people go to you. You know, Susan Carlin's a friend of mine and whenever anything happens, whether it's terrorism or burkas or anything at all, people say, what do you think? Anything around Pauline Hanson, what do you think? You know, please speak on behalf of the Muslim community. Yeah. Do you get that as well in terms of people want comments from you all the time speaking on behalf of your community and is that something that sits well with you or something that can become tiring? 
Um, yeah, I think that that people do tend to go to like a representative of the community. Like, oh, will you answer on behalf of all of your people? And there's just no way that I could possibly do that. I'm sure Susan feels the same. You know, people are like, oh, did you hear what Mark Latham said about this thing? Or yeah, did you what's hear your what- comment, Brooke? Yeah, and I'm like, I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone. I can hardly speak on behalf of my own family, let alone, you know, the other hundreds of thousands of Aboriginal people in this country. And I think the thing about being involved in the media for me is to show that there are a diverse range of Aboriginal people. You know, like Warren Mundine might speak for some people. Marcia Langton might speak for some people. Um, Miranda Tapsell might speak for some people. And I speak for some people, but mostly just myself. And it's weird because like, you know, people would never walk up to a non-Indigenous person and be like, oh, so the Prime Minister said this. Can you please answer and tell me That's what you right. think about that? You know, <laughs> like I wouldn't just white people. Yeah, I wouldn't just walk up to a white guy on the street and be like, interesting budget. What's your answer to that? <laughs> you know, like it would just never happen. <laughs> Um, but I, I think that that's probably like a, a you know consequence of having so few Indigenous people in the media. Are some people surprised to discover that you're Indigenous? Yes. Probably not so much now because no. you're famous. But oh, yeah, that's <laughs> I hate this idea that I'm famous. It makes me feel so weird. Look, you're sitting here. You've got a publicist sitting here. <laughs> I think we're officially in famous territory yeah, now. Yeah, I don't know. I'm still getting used to it. But before, did people used to get surprised? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think a lot of the time, you know, I just look a bit ethnically ambiguous. And so they're like, oh, is one of your parents Greek? Are you Italian? I feel like anywhere that I've traveled in the world, people it, think that I'm from that country, but also have you. a white parent, you know? <laughs> like I went to India last year a couple of times and people are like, oh, are you from Rajasthan? And I'm like, no, I am Aboriginal. And then they're like, really? Um, but every, that happens everywhere I go. I think it's just, I just always look like I've been on holidays, basically. You know, I'm just all permanently tanned. Does it mean that you were sometimes in the past around to hear people make racist comments? Yes. I'm like nodding at you as you're saying it. Yeah. I'm like, I know where you're going. And yes, it happens all the time where people are like, oh, we're in a safe space. We're all among, you know, we're all the same here. Let me just tell you about this funny joke. And um, my boyfriend is not Aboriginal and he was sort of, he wasn't surprised. He didn't doubt me or anything. But the, f- the first kind of few times it happened, it happened in the space of like a couple of weeks, maybe three times because mm. um, it happens frequently. I don't, I think that some people are very comfortable with expressing pretty controversial or shitty opinions. And he was like, I can't believe that people say this sort of stuff and that they feel comfortable saying it. He said that he was at a dinner once and someone had told a joke that was like pretty off colour, pardon the pun. And um, he was like, oh, mate, like I just want to stop you right there because what you've said is actually um, really inappropriate. And not only is it inappropriate, but my girlfriend's Aboriginal, so it's offensive to me. And I'd prefer it if you didn't say that. And How was that received? Oh, the guy was like, oh, oh, sorry, mate. Like, oh, just joking. Yeah. Oh, we're just having a joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I, I think it's sort of a catch-22 because I think there's no I, – I don't just think. I know that there is um, – my life has been easier because I can sort of move between the two worlds than someone who is, you know, has darker skin or um, speaks in a different way. And, um, you know, I know that – you know, if I looked more like traditionally Aboriginal, then I may, may not have been afforded all of the opportunities that I have been. And it's a you know a sad sort of indictment on, on where we are as a, as a as a people or as a country to to know that. But you know I I think um, there's good and bad that come with it. I think it's this weird thing as well where you sort of straddle both worlds. So sometimes. Um, people who are really dark-skinned Aboriginal people are like, oh, you're not black enough or, you know. And so sometimes you you, do, you have a foot in both camps but you really sit in, in neither and, and that can be a really difficult thing. But one of my favourite quotes from, um, I think it is maybe Nikita Louie. It's from Black Comedy, I think. She's another Gamilaro woman, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's something like, no matter how much milk you put in a cup of tea, it's still a cup of tea. And that's the way that I think of Aboriginality. (laughs) That's beautiful. Yeah. 
Thanks for listening to No Filter. Brooke is an ambassador for the Witchery White Shirt Campaign. Tell me why you decided to get involved with Witchery in the White Shirt Campaign. I was really, really alarmed to hear that there's no early detection test. There's no way to diagnose it early. So a woman dies every eight hours or something like that in Australia from ovarian cancer. And the reason that the, um, that the rate is so high is because, you know, the symptoms, they're just really normal things. Like, you could be a bit bloated. Mm. Or, you know, you, I don't know. That to me, I'm like, that's every day for yeah. me. You know, every time I have some bread or pasta. Um, and there's no way for them to detect it early enough to be able to catch it. So most of the women who are diagnosed are diagnosed in the late stages which is awful. It's really awful. So what's the message though? Because whenever I hear those words, I just think, well, great. Like, what can you do? Well, that's why we're trying to raise money so that they can start to do more research. Well, they've already been doing more research because the campaign's been going for like 11 years. Mm. But so that they can raise money to develop an early detection test because that really will impact um, how many women die from this sort of cancer. And you can find out more about that by following the link in our show notes. And if you're looking for something to listen to next, can I recommend an episode of The Quickie where the team spoke to an intimacy coordinator? Now, I kind of wish I'd have done this for a no filter. I've got a bit of FOMO. This is like a choreographer in a dance movie or they have choreographers in fight scenes. But did you know they now have intimacy coordinators who essentially choreograph sex scenes particularly around all the new streaming tv shows the one that um the quickie team spoke to is a woman called um Ita and she was the intimacy coordinator for a bunch of films and tv shows most notably one that I absolutely loved I think it was on Netflix called Sex Education where there were some really full-on sex scenes um girl girl boy girl boy boy and Certainly in the age of Me Too, you can only imagine the fraught situations that are involved when people are naked at work with co-workers in front of a crew. So I highly recommend this episode of The Quickie. We'll link to it in the show notes and subscribe to our daily podcast, The Quickie, because they have amazing stories like that. No Filter is produced by Liza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman. You can subscribe to my newsletter by going to miafriedman.com.au and I will see you on Mamma Mia.